Yeah. Has what? Yeah. You see this inside slice down the computer. So I'm saying anyone has chewing gum? Oh, oh chewing gum. <laughs> I'm just kidding. She's not gonna stick. Do you need to have a that? I think it's uh, time to begin. Um, so thank you so much for all of you who have uh, chosen to come to this session. We hope to make it interesting and worthwhile your time. Uh, my name is Aurora Colado. I work with the NYU. And uh, here is my colleague. My name is Kat Hatke. Um I also work with NYU, but with um, Global Technology Services. And also, there should be a third person here today who deserves to mention Armanda Lewis, who also did a lot of work on this project, and she also works for Global Technology Services, but could not make the conference. So um, I think we're going to start out with just a general introduction of how we ended up coming up with the requirements that we did, and then talk to you about the requirements. And then at the end, we're actually going to um, set you loose on one of our testing environments. We've got some test IDs for you to use that you can try out some of these new features for yourself. Okay, so um, this project's been about a year and a half at this point in the making. In early 2013, Armanda, uh, started to do a survey of some assessment features in the Sakai community. So she looked at um, third-party tools that are proprietary, things like Blackboard, to see what kind of assessment features they added. She looked into other schools and what they've been doing for assessment features. She looked into other open source software like Moodle. And then she came up with sort of a master list of some of the features that were the most requested at other schools or in other programs. And then from there, it sort of filtered down into some of our various committees and subcommittees in NYU that kind of handle oversight for what the faculty wants and what the faculty doesn't want. And that's how we ended up with some of the um, seven new features that have been added here today. And uh, those are the features we are going to be talking about. Uh, and those include peer assessment uh, within the assignments tool, image reuse uh, and hotspot within test and quizzes, audio questions within rich text editor, within the rich text editor, scrum player, which uh, is a tool in itself, a new, uh, new tool, uh, which has been named interactive modules, accordion syllabus, which is the new syllabus tool, and the adaptive learning um, included within the lessons tool. And the first thing we are going to start with is the VR assessment. You might have had the opportunity to see some uh, presentations about VR assessment already, but uh, hopefully we'll give you something that you haven't seen before. And also, uh, very briefly, I would like to say thank you to Longsai. Uh, Nicola is here with us today, and she's been working with us in this project. Um, we would like to thank her for coming and for all the exhausting work that she's been doing with us. Thank you very much, <laughs> and all on the side. Um, so uh, the requirements for the uh, peer assessment uh, feature uh, were ability for students to assess and offer feedback on each other's work, the ability to keep track of the peer review grades as they come in, and the ability to maintain the anonymity of the student reviewed and the student uh, reviewer. So here is what an assessment um, setting page looks like, which is uh, way longer than what we would like, but <laughs> uh, more features, more, uh, more options, uh, longer page. So the um, peer assessment option is right there. And when you click on it, uh, you will get more uh, options expanding. And these options. Uh, uh, look something like this, and we are going to look in detail about what those are. Uh, the options include uh, the integration with the gradebook, so the grade that the students give to each other can be uh, sent to the gradebook directly. Uh, anonymous evaluation, so somewhere around here, oh, let's see. somewhere up around here, you have the ability to say whether you want um, students to uh, the, the evaluation to be anonymous or not. Uh, the option to show or hide um, uh, peer reviewers, 
um, which is uh, also here. The option to select the number of reviews to be completed by students. So you can enter the name two, three, or four. Um, and it's also group aware. So you can select the groups that you want to release this peer review assignment to. So this is what the student would see once the student has submitted uh, the assignment and the peer review period has started. Uh, the student would see something like this. Uh, this is the assignment link which has been uh, submitted and this is the peer review and in this case the student uh, has reviewed two of uh, uh, two students, has to review three students. Uh, this student has completed two reviews but he still has one more review to complete. So to complete a review or to start a review you click on the link and you see a page uh, which includes uh, the description of the assignment. Uh, here the instructor gave some uh, information about how um, it, it is a bit like a rubric and that is um, everybody can write whatever they want. It's just uh, a rich text editor where you can write information. Yes? Are these special tools that are only available at NYU or are these parts of Sakai Tech? This, uh, some of the tools that we are going to be talking about today will be, are only in NYU, but they are available for the entire community to uh, make, take advantage of. Um, some of them, because of the timing when they were developed, some of them made it into Sakai 10, some of them didn't. This one in particular made it into Sakai 10. So if you are using Sakai 10, you can use it, or you can backport it. Because we are using Sakai 2.8 and we have already these features. So all the features that we are going to be talking today, either if they didn't make it into Sakai 10, they can be back backported. So anyone can start using them right away. Okay, so um, so here we see the uh, student submission with an attachment, and now here the student is going to be the grade. This is where the student enters the grade. We have written, it has read the assignment and gave a 50. That was a poor evaluation, I think. And also there is a uh, room here for the student to to write comments. So after the student uh, has submitted, after the evaluation period has finished, uh, the student will see something like this. Uh, in this case, it says incomplete because uh, if the student doesn't complete, if you have three students to evaluate and you only evaluate to two, it will say it's incomplete. It will show completed if you have evaluated all the students that you were supposed to be evaluated. This, uh, this student click on uh, cancel after this work. That's why it's not me. <laughs> okay, uh, so the instructor view um, of the submitted reviews. So this is what the instructor would see um, uh, while the students are reviewing. It, um, this is what the instructor uh, would see. Here the instructor can see that uh, uh, these two students have submitted reviews uh, for these students. So I can also, if I look at the computer, I cannot talk. So, um, is the student uh, uh, student two eighty three has been reviewed by two students, uh, student um, Tessie and student Takush. And uh, each uh, student Tessie gave a hundred points, and student Taki gave uh, fifty points. So the mean uh, would be seventy five points. So that's what the student um, um, 283, Tabitha, okay. <laughs> um, So if the instructor wants to see specifically what were the comments that the student uh, Takish brought for Tabitha, then he would click on these links, so all of these are links, where the instructor can click and see what is specifically uh, the grade, and also the student comments. And at this point, uh, the instructor can say, remove this, uh, this review. And um, even after it's been removed, it can uh, retroactively be added. So don't worry about removing because you can add it back if you change your mind. OK, so imagine that the instructor thinks that uh, this 50 is a very poor review that this student deserves in reality. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Something a little higher. The instructor has the opportunity to override um, the grade by going to grade. And this thing, grading, will only show up after the, uh, the um, peer review period has finished. So now the instructor um, can decide whether it wants to give the 27 uh, point value or uh, if, um, if he or she wants to uh, overwrite it with something else. And there is a comment there that says so. So they are more um, about that. Okay. Once the grades have been released, the students uh, go to the assignments tool and they will click on their uh, on the link for the assignment, and there they will see uh, their final grade, 75 points, and also they will see the feedback uh, and the points that they received from each of the other students. In this case, it says review R1 and review R2 because it was anonymous. If it had not been anonymous, then the instructor had, can uh, choose that. Then the student would see the name uh, of the uh, students who reviewed um, him or her. Okay. Uh, image reviews, uh, hotspot. Uh, these, uh, these are, this capability lives within the test and quiz system. Um, so the requirements for the image reviews uh, were to eliminate the need for features embedded in question pools and quizzes to reside in the resources tool of the course where the questions were created. I think we are all familiar with the issue of copying uh, test and quizzes and losing, <coughs> <Sorry>. <coughs> and losing all the features that were embedded. So we were trying to resolve that, uh, that issue. Uh, the way it works is very similar to where it works normally. Uh, the icon is exactly the same. So when you click on the icon, you see this um, pop-up box uh, where you have the option to upload content either from uh, to embed a feature either from your resources or from your computer, just as it was before. But as you can see, uh, these two uh, options are different from what it looked before. So the mechanism is exactly the same. However, um, it is, as you can see, uh, the functionality is different. Because now the features are not going to be going to the resources tool, they go to another location, where they are going to be available, but they are carried over from one course to another. Okay, and uh, Kat is going to talk about the hotspot image. Okay. <clears throat> Um, hotspot image is one of the ones that's not actually in Sakai 10, but uh, we wanted to talk you through it anyway. So for those of you who aren't familiar, hotspot is essentially where you upload an image and then you sort of draw a zone. And within that zone is an item that students have to label. And so if they click within the zone, they get it right. If they click outside the zone, they get it wrong. So for us, this is a new question type within testing quizzes. So it gives instructors the ability to draw zones um, on the image itself. So we came up with sort of a um, pre-filled explanatory text in the rich text editor, which maybe you can read here. Um, but it says, identify the items located below by clicking on the corresponding part of the image. The green button indicates the item that you're working on. So we tried to make this more explicit because um, one of the more confusing aspects of Hotspot, at least in our UX testing, was trying to figure out the process of which is the active item and which is not. Um, you can see one item here right now that would technically obviously be the active item because there's only one, but um, as you'll see in the next screenshot, there's usually two squares that appear there, and so it can be sort of confusing. Um, this type of question is uh, able to award partial credit or not. Um, basically what happens is depending on the number of points that you assign to that question, it just sort of divvies those up according to the number of items. And if students get one of them right, then they get partial credit. Or if you choose not to give them partial credit, they miss one, then they get zero points. Um, and it lends itself well to more visual test questions. Um, some professors have been interested in things like labeling anatomy. Uh, for instance, maybe you want the student to be able to pinpoint where the spleen is or something. And so this works really well with those. 
but this is kind of how our setup is right now. Um, at this point, you upload the hotspot image before, or I'm sorry, after. Um, one of the issues that we've run into is that, as you can see here, um, the attachment button is directly below it, and so that's led to a little bit of confusion. Um, people think that adding an attachment is adding the hotspot image, which is not the case. So, um, in the step-by-step -step process, it's pretty simple. Um, you basically create however many items you want to create. At this point, we've tested as high as 45 items. I don't know why you would want to go much higher than that or even that high, but it is possible. Um, so, as you can see, this is kind of the buttons that I was talking about before. It's caused a little bit of confusion, but once you get the hang of it, it's usually okay. Um, one of the main disconnects that we're looking into fixing at this point is that at this point instructors can be typing um, in one item, for instance here you can see uh, enter item description is highlighted at the moment, but that actually doesn't talk to the buttons themselves and so item one could be the active item right now, but if you're working on item two, you're still going to be drawing for item one and so um, we're hoping to maybe fix that down the road. So what the students see for Hotspot is what you see here. So it opens up the question, they have their instructions above, which hopefully the instructors have left, although since it's in the Reg Text Editor, they obviously have the option to edit it or to add or to delete if they like. Um, but here are the two items. Students can go in and select those items. Um, and then when they're done, it gets submitted to the instructor, and this is what the instructor will see. So this is essentially what the students submitted. You can maybe kind of make out that there are little bullseyes right there, and they are numbered according to the number of items above. So that's kind of important to correspond. So in this case, the uh, student did not correctly identify the bridge. And so um, it tells you down here that they didn't get that one correct, and it tells you what the student submitted. And then for the instructor, it also tells them what their original zones were. And so, yes? So does it sort of work like a matching, where there's zones and then you tell them match this with this? Uh, no, it's not quite matching. It's um, essentially, so to use this as an example, so you can kind of see in the zones down here below, um, when the instructor is creating the question, let me back up. So they drew this zone right here, because item one is St. Peter's Basilica, and so they drew a zone around St. Peter's Basilica. And so at that point then, when the students get the question, all they see is this, but they know that they have to label St. Peter's Basilica. So they would click on St. Peter's Basilica. And then that gets submitted to the system, and it determines whether they clicked within the zone that the instructor assigned. So what does the student see when they click? When they click, they see this. Um, so they're going to see um, this little, I know it's very small even on this screen, but um, we had to keep it kind of small so that it would be precise when they're trying to click on an object. But um, they would see this little number, this corresponds number one is St. Peter's Basilica above, and then they see the little bullseye, which is what is actually counting um, as their location that they spent. Does that clarify? Well, we get to play with this later, right? Yes, you will. <laughs> Probably be easier to understand. Okay, great. All right, so the next item then is, oh, actually, one more thing I wanted to add that will probably come up, so just to preempt it. Um, at this point, one of the limitations is the fact that you can only draw rectangular zones in Hotspot, and so that can be a little bit of a problem. Um, as you can see in the case of the bridge here, the student could hypothetically click on the arches in between, which is not technically the bridge, but they would still get that right. Um, so ideally, we would love to be able to just draw the zones accordingly, but um, we're not there yet. And then one of the other issues that's come up is that you can only assign one zone to one item. And so you can't assign multiple zones to one item, and on the flipped, you can't assign multiple items to one zone. And so that's come up, um, for instance, with the anatomy example that I mentioned before, that you want students to identify a kidney. There are two kidneys, but you can't draw a zone around each kidney. Now the zones only boxes, or can you do preform? Uh, that's what we'd like to do at this point, just boxes, though. OK, so audio questions. This is available in Sakai 10. Um, and what's kind of unique about it is that it's a new button in the Rich Text Editor. And so it is available in um, any place where you can find the Rich Text Editor. 
So it gives you the ability to make recordings anywhere the rich text editor appears. You can record up to three minutes, and you can re-record, you can preview, um, make sure that you like it before you place it in the post. So this is the little icon. Um, in our UX testing, some people said that it looked like a uh, light post, but it's actually a microphone. And um, once you click it, it pulls up this little widget, which um, may be grayed out at first. One issue that we've run into is that it has to ask permission to use the microphone first. And in Chrome in particular, it tends to appear at the top of the browser window, and people will miss it. And so then their buttons stay grayed out, and then people complain. So just something to keep in mind if you want to use this in your schools. Um, OK, so after you've recorded it and you've decided that you liked it, once you place it in the post, um, you get kind of a weird configuration here. And this is because we have Sakai 2.8. And so it has to be compatible with Internet Explorer 8. And we were running into a lot of problems with um, players that were created in other browsers not showing up in Internet Explorer or recordings that were created in Internet Explorer not showing up in other browsers. And so this was kind of the solution that um, Longsight came up with. We have uh, player one, a two, and player two, a two. One of these is just for Internet Explorer, and one of these is for everything else. So um, we changed the name mostly because we were hoping that people would get the idea that they should not be deleting either of these, because that's going to be a problem. Um, but it did cause some confusion where some people would think that it was a mistake that there were two items in the target, and so then they would try to delete one. So don't do that. Um, we've run into a few issues with feedback. Um, you'll notice in the little instructions here, it says using headphones while recording is recommended. That's largely because there tends to be feedback sometimes if you aren't using headphones when you record. So that's the best solution that we found at this point anyway, and it's probably better for audio quality in the first place. Yep. Is the audio stored in like resources, or can you come, can you edit the audio at all? Um, you can't edit it. I mean, the best you can do is re-record it. So if you don't like it, um, you could go in and delete it and re-record. But it, it's a very simple, functional approach. And so that you can't pre-submit a recorded, you can't submit a pre-recorded audio or something. Um, oh well, I mean, if you have pre-recorded audio, then I mean that oh, would yeah, be a different sorry. button. Yeah, um, this is just for recording audio at the moment. Um, I think that pretty much covers it for audio. So, oh, one more thing. Um, kind of like Aurora mentioned with the image embeds, um, audio does transfer from course to course. And so, if you want to save a question in testing courses that or testing courses that has audio recording in it, um, you can save it in a question pool, and it'll be available to you in other courses. Okay, SCORM player. I don't know how many of you are using SCORM here, but um, this is specifically requested by our faculty. And so we kind of considered using the TinCan API and SCORM Cloud, but pretty much the functionality that they wanted was very simple. And so we found that um, SCORM 2004 uh, third edition worked for us. So we kept it pretty basic. Um, it gives you the ability to, to display SCORM content within NYU classes, um, the ability to confirm if a student has completed a module or at the very least has opened it, and um, the ability for the SCORM player to interact with the gradebook. And so there's an option in the SCORM um, configure menu that lets you decide if you want to send it to the gradebook or not. Do yep. you know what application that faculty is using to create their SCORM content? Yeah, they tend to favor um, Articulate and Captivate for the most part. Um, particularly Captivate, I think, is cheaper. Um, SCORM has been kind of difficult to test, actually, for that exact reason. Um, some of the issues that we've run into, you have to figure out, is this an issue with the SCORM tool? Is it an issue with the module? Or is it an issue with the software that was used to create the module? which we found actually has a huge impact on how nicely it plays with the SCORM tool, or how not nicely it plays. Um, and we also renamed it Interactive Modules, which is why you're seeing that up there, because SCORM player is not intuitive at all. Um, so instructors can keep track of student attempts 
in a perfect world. Um, that's something that we're working on now with the SWARM tool. As I mentioned, our faculty tends to use Articulate and Captivate, and so we're sort of working within that framework now. But it turns out that either Articulate and Captivate don't, um, I don't know, they either don't track data in the same way, or the SWARM tool doesn't know where to look for it, but either way, we're having some troubles with um, tracking student attempts with modules that are created in that software. Um, at the moment, an attempt is defined by uh, creating or going through a module, and so um, our faculty is interested in sort of changing that at this point because they'd like for their SCORM content to be available um, at any point that the students want to review it. What they want instead is for it to be limiting the number of times that they can take the quiz within the SCORM content. And so that's something that we're working on right now as well. Um, also right now, there's a feature on the environment that you guys are going to be able to look at in a little bit here. Um, that would technically allow you to um, decide whether you want it to report the most recent or the highest grade to the gradebook, and uh, there's a reason that that change never made it past this particular environment, so feel free to ignore it, uh, which doesn't work at the moment thanks to articulating captivity. Um, I think that's pretty much it for SCORM. Oh, you have a question? So that's a separate tool. That doesn't talk to one of the other tools. Um, only to the gradebook to right. report score. Yeah. So you, 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 you designate which grade you want it to, or does it create a grade? Or? At the moment, um, it just reports for articulating, this is a surprisingly complicated question. Um, for articulating Captivate modules, it's reporting whatever the most recent score is that they receive. Regardless. So you have to create a grade ahead of time and, and associate it, or does it create one for you in the grade? It creates one for you. But um, if you have any other questions about the more technical side of SCORM, Nicola, our developer, is back there. Okay. Then Aurora is going to take over for Adam <coughs> So another one of the features that uh, wanted to that the community wanted to develop was uh, more ad uh, ability for more adaptive learning, and this uh, uh, lives within the lesson store. So in this, um, the, the requirements were the ability to release text and multimedia items only when uh, prerequisites have been completed, since uh, these two were the only items within the lesson source for which this feature was not available. Uh, ability for instructors to more easily use the lesson tool. Um, and this is to do with the fact that um, we did some UI testing and we found out that uh, faculty were having um, difficulty using the lessons tool because the tool menu was very confusing. So that was a deterrent for, for instructors to start using the lessons tool. Um, we, were very, we thought it was a pity because it, the lessons tool is, is wonderful or has a lot of potentials. Um, the ability for students to more easily keep track of the lessons content and work required. This was important. Uh, also, this feature was also important because uh, when you are working with um, with um, adaptive learning, so is uh, the content or appears and disappears first uh, based on certain rules that the faculty member has set up, uh, and therefore it's more important than ever that the students get a, a clear picture of what they've done, what they completed, what they need to complete what is uh, to be done. And uh, during the process of um, looking at uh, how to uh, meet these uh, requirements, uh, we discovered that uh, some of these requirements were in the Lessons um, 10 uh, tool, so the Lessons tool that is included in Sakai 10. So instead of developing all of them, what we did was we backported some of these uh, lessons tools uh, from Sakai 10 into Sakai 2.8. So uh, this, if you are interested in backporting that functionality, uh, we've done that work, and I believe you should be able to, to benefit from it and do what we've done. So the first aspect, aspect that I mentioned was uh, text and multimedia items can now be released upon the completion of a prerequisite. And the way it works is that uh, when uh, you have an item, for example, in this case an item with a video, 
Uh, when you click on edit, uh, you get the option for the different settings. And within the options, you will see here uh, the option to, uh, to only release the item after the requirements have been completed. That didn't exist before, and now it does exist for text items and for multimedia items. And that was specifically developed by uh, NYU. Uh, the other feature that I mentioned was the newly redesigned uh, tool menu that makes the lessons tool more intuitive and easier to use. This is something that we backported into 2.8. So this is the, how the old menu looked like. And as I said, it was very confusing, confusing because there were many different options. Some of them did the exact same work job which uh, became very confusing. And then there was another, uh, more tools. Uh, most people could not get to see uh, what these uh, options, that these options were here. Um, so now with the new, um, this is what the new menu looks like. Um, it's much more uh, simpler. And it's been, um, the number of options have been consolidated, which makes it much easier for faculty to identify what exactly they need to do or what each of those tools do. Um, so this is what it looks like when you click on add content. Now all the options to add content are together. Um, the other menu that was kind of showing off at, uh, on that was always uh, lost and forgotten, now it is uh, much clearer. And it shows under more tools. OK, so the next feature I'm going to talk about is the uh, indexing pages. Um, it was very important, as I said, to keep track, to be able to keep track of the work that the students were doing. Um, as you can see, this is a comparison of the index of pages of the old um, Lesson to uh, before you could see only pages and sub pages in the index. Now, uh, this is uh, an example of the new index. And here you can see um, uh, not only you can see pages and sub pages, but then, for example, here if I click on this page, I'll be able to see what is the content within that page. I also can see if the content is required or not. Uh, in this case, this content is required before this item can be released, and the students can easily keep track of that. Um, this is an example of when the lesson is completed, you will get a green check. Okay. The accordion syllabus. Um, the requirement for the accordion syllabus was to have the ability to dynamically expand content by sections but to avoid, avoid lengthy text blocks with many difficult, uh, uh, which may make difficult to find information such as students require coursework like assignments and quizzes. Um, this is an example of the syllabus tool, what it looks like now. Uh, and again, this exists in Sakai 10, and there are several different versions of the um, accordion syllabus tool. Uh, ours looks a little different from others. We made some modifications to the workflow. And um, again, it's available for anyone who wishes to uh, take advantage of it. So continue, continuing, uh, this is what the, um, the syllabus tool looks now. Um, for example, this is an example of how um, uh, the students are required to um, read certain content then um, take a quiz, and then do uh, work together um, in groups. And it's all, um, it can be added uh, to, the, to the syllabus. Um, so the ability to create more than one item at a time is one of the, uh, the nice features that this uh, syllabus includes. Uh, this is what it looks like when you don't have any content at all. So when you click on Add, you are going to have the option to um, to say how many units you want to create. The title, give it a title, and like, uh, in this case, I'm going to create seven units. And I only said unit because then the system will automatically give me the name unit one, unit two, unit three, unit four. So that makes things easier. Um, 
Also, you have the ability to create items by date. So in this case, uh, I click on Add, and I have the um, I have the ability to create items by date. So uh, here is uh, what I say. Um, uh, I select the start date, the end date, uh, the timing, and I select. Uh, I can select to all these items to the calendar if I want to. And when they are added to the calendar, they look exactly the same as what they look in the syllabus. So the students can either go through the calendar or go through the syllabus to look at what is uh, due for a specific date. And uh, you select what dates of the week you are you want to do. You, you are going to uh, have those items for, and uh, the system will automatically create those for you and post them to the calendar if you wish to, to do so. Um, another feature is the ability to expand all or selected items. So if you click on, uh, if for example here I, I want to select um, um, only see item 2, I could do so. And it would look something like this. So I have unit one over here and unit two over here, but I'm only looking at expanding or viewing unit two. Um, but I could also say, hey, I want to see everything at once, and I could do that. So once I click on uh, select all, all the all the um, items would open up. Uh, in this case, you can see I added a video there. So. Um, let's take a look at what it looks like when you are editing an item. Um, well, okay, we are going to look at that in a second. Uh, right now, so um, the other feature that uh, the syllabus tool has is the ability to reorder items with drag and drop and delete items in bulk. So this is a very nice feature. Um, for example, when you go to edit, um, you see the ability to uh, drag and drop items. You just kind of click on this um, icon and you can drag and drop items. You can remove items from here. Uh, you can remove them all or select which ones you want to remove. And the same for posting items or to add them to the calendar. And here is what, uh, when you click on edit, okay, let me show you. Um, so after um, going to edit, sorry about it, to, to edit an item, you would click on um, this uh, link over here. For example, if I want to, to edit uh, this item, and once I click on that uh, link, uh, I go to the page, the uh, kind of form page that we use to create an item. And right here, is, uh, this is what I was referring to before. So we are creating an item in a rich text box editor. So anything that you can do in a rich text box editor um, is going to show up in your syllabus item. So you can add multimedia, or you can add um, mathematical symbols, or you know, highlight the text, or make it in different colors, etc., etc. And uh, that is it. Limitations. Limitations, as um, Kat was mentioning, we found a lot of technical issues uh, during all this process, so it was not easy, but uh, we made it through. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> and also, time. Time is always uh, of the essence, and you know, uh, you have to, you know, sometimes uh, make compromises in order to meet deadlines and. Um, Hopefully, whatever was not resolved, uh, we is a work in progress. You know, JIRAs exist and they are out there, and we are working on them as as fast as we can. Um, okay, I'm going to hand out some test IDs now. Hopefully, we have enough for all of you um, NYU people. Sorry, you don't get any, but um, <laughs> you have about 24 hours before the firewall is going to go back up. So use your time wisely. <laughs> <laughs> And um, while you are working on um, testing, uh, we'd be happy to take any, any questions that you may have because we've gone through this quite fast, so you might have some questions. Okay. 
Could you confirm again what features are available in 2.10 and which ones you backported into 2.8? Well, we backported everything into 2A because we are in 2A. Yeah, so, so everything can be used in 2A. But in 10, uh, the accordance levels is going to be in 10. The peer review is going to be in 10. Um, the, um, the tool for, OK, let me go to the first um, slide to make things easier. So peer assessment is in 10, mm -hmm. uh, image reuse is in 10, audio questions is in 10, strong player is in 10, according to syllabus is in 10, adaptive learning is in 10. So only the hotspot didn't make it. Only the hotspot. But the difference is that um, the way they show in 10 might be a little bit different from the way we have them. Sure. Because, uh, for example, for the for the um, for some of these tools, for example, for the syllabus, we may change this to the workflow that might not be in the actual accordion syllabus that exists in ten. And actually, Nicola knows about that very well. So, if you want very specifically to know, um, she can tell you that. The interactive modules is in ten. It is yes. Well, I mean, form player, what interactive modules is, is a strict tool. So it's not, with the release of Sakai 10, a lot of tools that were previously script tools did become part of core, uh, but form player and interactive modules is not one of them. So what happens, for example, the Scrum player is a non trick tool. So it's not a tool that we developed, but we, what we did was we took that tool and we changed certain things about it. We improved it. We like to think so. But the other things so are if you want to take a, if you want to take advantage of the improvements we we did, they are available for anyone who wishes to do so. But the other things are in the core trunk of Sakai, right? The yeah. basic Sakai. Like peer assessment assignments, that's in the core of Sakai and assignment okay. school. Um, all the other ones. Hotspot will be in core, but it's school assignments. It's making it for ten years. And the new menus and lessons, that's the way lessons will look in 10? Yeah, and actually that the, the reorganization of the menus wasn't necessarily, I, I, I don't know who actually did that work uh, off the top of my head, and I want to make sure that they get complimented too. That was something that was done in the community to be back for it. Okay. I think it was, um, was it Mishka, I think? Yes. Probably the, uh, Any other questions? So the, the audio questions is part of the new CK editor, is that right? Yeah, so that's actually yes. the thing to ask about, because I wanted to say, when we talk about tests and quizzes and we talk about audio question types, there's two different kinds of audio question types you can have. So you can have a question type where the audio is a question, like where I record a question and the student answers. And then there's also, there was a legacy question type in where you typed in a question and the student recorded audio as part of their response. Right. Like, what I'm saying is it's, it's really not an not a, a assessment feature, it's a CK editor feature, right? You can use it, it is a, yes. Yeah. It, it was introduced as, it was seen as a way to assess the students because we thought the idea was, oh, we can put it on assignments, we can put it in test and quizzes, but in reality it's available anywhere where the CK editor shows. Older versions of Sakai, could you just update the CK editor without worrying about it? You could. I mean, it depends on what version of Sakai and what version of CK editor you want to go to. I do know that the button, um, the way the buttons are done in the CK editor, change significantly from like the 3X series to the 4 series. So, like, the guy said, you use CK editor 4. Um, so, if there's there's different things that you have to take into consideration depending on what version you're targeting or what. But, yeah, theoretically, it's possible. In both the cases of image reuse and audio questions, the actual artifact, as the image or the, the audio recording, has to be stored somewhere. And so in both cases, we take advantage of a feature of Sakai 10, which we backported for NYU, that allows us to create a special hidden places with that material that's not in the course resources, um, but still associated with the course. So that would be the only thing that you might expect to store in the audio. 
And there's also a module that allows you to save your data to the system that you have to bring back to the So it's not just a button that seeks the whole world workflow. Yeah. We've also bring back to the point. Bring it back to be important as possible as they've shown. I see everybody is working hard. I hope you are enjoying the testing because you are all testing at this time. I'm pretty sure of that. Thank you. Thank you. We really appreciate it. We worked really hard. <laughs> and we made everything available to the community. That was also part of the idea. <laughs>